aspects of, uh, of other little languages such as R, um, all the way to uh, the programming practices and processes. And uh, well, the material in the course is assembled to provide you with key tools to enable you to enhance productivity and lower vulnerability to risk in your jobs as software engineers, administrators, uh, system administrators, etc. It is a fairly diverse set of material, and I wanted to, to give you uh, a bit of a glimpse of what it includes to set expectations. I also want to set expectations in terms of the standards for this course. This is an intense course. It contains assignments, it contains labs, midterm and final exams, and there's an expectation that you will come to have a very solid understanding of and hopefully master in many cases the diversity of, of different topics. So when we talk about the, the marketing scheme that will be in place for this course during the semester, those of you who have access to the, the web right now, you may want to look at the video page, which uh, also discusses this in additional details. I'll talk a little bit about the textbooks, which um, address a subset bit more detail to, to give a flavor. And as I said, as time allows, we'll actually dive into some of the, the first topics uh, within the course. So, um, this is me, uh, the talk here. Uh, my office is over at Orbitson. Uh I do hold office hours uh, to be scheduled immediately following this course on both Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, if those times are prohibitive for you, or you want to uh, you want to engage me at another time that's uh, more convenient, uh, feel free to write. You can set up appointments for that purpose. You can also use the online advising system to set up appointments uh, in that capacity. Um, a little bit about my background. I have, uh, over the course of my professional life, uh, spanned academia, uh, started a number of small companies, um, worked in some very large firms, and uh, generally done a great deal of software development, both in a uh, commercial, professional context on the one hand for different products like itself, and on the other for a uh, wide variety of, of academic, uh, academic projects. Um, I consider myself a software engineer, and um, that uh, perspective will be significantly informing <coughs> which is taught with different, um, different emphases at different times. My background is such that uh, I know the risks associated with sloppy practices when it comes to software. And I will be helping to alert to those risks and helping to provide guidance that will lower your vulnerability to similar problems and, as I said, enhance productivity as well. And quality, productivity, which ultimately makes success in terms of, of delivery of software, whether it's in an in-house IT capacity or whether it's uh, commercial software services provided uh, through the web. <clears throat> it's a little bit about my background. Uh, the lab leader for this course is uh, uh, Scott Johnson, who's a uh, doctoral student uh, within computer science. He's also someone who has taken this course previously. should be available for additional meetings where required as well. So what are the overall uh, learning goals for this course? We'll talk about some of the specifics of the topics in a few minutes. But in terms of, of broad goals, um, the first is to develop and reinforce effective individual programming practices. Um, these include, but are not limited to some that are in your textbook's design, good commenting, and naming conventions, Error avoidance and software modularization, um, separating interface from implementation, appropriate use of abstractions, etc. Um, these are basic 
principles for creating systems that are maintainable, that can be shared and used by others. And if you don't follow a set of these practices, not only will you be behaving uh, in, a, in a fairly unprofessional way, but you'll be putting yourself at, at, at significant risk of, of uh, failure, whatever you're trying to accomplish. A second goal for this course is practice with effective techniques for quality assurance. And that goes along with, with the first. And, and clean coding and source code discipline, um, developing a, a set of principles that will guide you through how you interact uh, with your source code, such as the use of, of check-ins, diversion control software, will go a long way towards helping you more quickly debug a system, identify the cause for that failure that, that you know, stops you from or that failure that stops you from delivering your system to customers um, a few years down the road. We talked about the separation of uh, interface and communication from a conceptual standpoint, why it's important to do so to achieve flexibility within our programs, and uh, how it can lower, lower risks, how it can allow, for example, for, for mocking techniques or, or creation of subs. We're going to be talking about uh, testing a set of basic test practices aimed at you as an individual developer, um, so some of the basics of unit testing, and techniques from um, what are so, sometimes called defensive and offensive programs, such as the use of the church. The idea being, if there's an error in your program, you want to know it as soon as possible. You want it to fail early, so that you can quickly track down that error, and more importantly, so you can be aware that it exists in the first place before that code is used by someone who doesn't have the capacity to track down the error and isn't aware of, of how you can help go about this. We're going to talk about some basic collaborative programming techniques, bearing in mind that there's a set of courses for those interested, 370, 371, 470, um, that uh, some of you may wish, wish to take which will expose you to the team processes. I, I teach 371. Um, it involves large, 10-ish or so person teams. And the heart of it is, is getting at the, the vexing issues of collaboration, coordination within projects. Here I want to give you a glimpse of some of the techniques that are required in that context, but can also bear fruit for you as an individual adult, someone trying to create some basic mechanisms even if it's only a script for IT purposes, um, that will uh, it'll protect you from So configuration manager, one step of uh, compilation, um, use of, of make files of the most basic or, or, or build scripts uh, in the context of, of many IDEs. Uh, version management uh, principles and, and pair programming and, and give a glimpse of other uh, peer review processes things that can really help you um, uh, identify issues before they get to the surface. Okay, so we're trying to provide you here with exposure to key tools, key building blocks and techniques that will let you go further in subsequent classes and let you go further in your career. We're also going to be introducing in the process some little languages and scripting, uh, such as self-scripting techniques um, and uh, Glimpses of languages such as awk, which um, will provide useful tools for getting things done and allow you to behave in terms of your productivity uh, at, a, at a level that far exceeds those who have never taken a course like this. And you're going to see in the process some, you know, some basic uh, techniques for interacting with the common tools that are uh, part of the course for day to day work by people. Industry and throughout the IT industry, in diverse uh, companies, organizations, institutions, blah, blah. These include things like uh, editors, compilers, uh, profilers, and debuggers, uh, profilers being to, to help uh, form under, understand performance issues or issues with memory, um, uh, memory overuse by your program, etc. Okay, so what's the, um, the environment for this course? Um, we're going to be working on this course predominantly under a Linux environment. Um, as 
provided by systems from the department. Um, I'm sure that people are, are all aware that we're in the Sphinx, uh, the Borlitz and the Sphinx extension. There's very large labs uh, outfitted with large numbers of machines that can move to make this Linux. And uh, Linux will provide a variety of tools that we'll be relying on for uh, delivering on labs and delivering on the assignments. The problem set. Some of those are, are listed there, and uh, others will be added there just trying to. Um, now, you, many of you will wish to work on your own, own personal computers, um, which is an admirable thing. It will allow you greater flexibility in how you pursue this work. Um, it is your responsibility to, to work to set that up, and sometimes it can be not trivial. Um, it's easier if you have already a Linux box at home or or if you have a, a Linux uh, notebook or laptop, um, or if you have a Mac machine on Windows, um, it's a dicier issue. Uh, the kind of simple solution is to create a, a dual boot machine, um, create a partition for Linux, uh, or to install a, a virtual machine, and there's a number out there, which will allow you to, to install a Linux on your machine in a, in a protected environment so that it runs alongside um, Windows. For those uh, who don't mind the challenge, you may want to install Sigwin, um, full Sigwin. Sigwin is a distributable that allows you to make use of a wide variety of Unix tools and um, Unix libraries, etc. Um, so you can use GCC with it, you can use Mayconoc in a uh, Linux um, type of fashion. But be aware that there have been issues experienced with that and uh, you may require recourse to one of these other options, dual booting or um, The machines over there, as I mentioned, are made to uh, Linux, which split off from Mandriva um, due to turmoil within the Mandriva uh, project over the past few years. And um, uh, those who are running Ubuntu or Red Hat or what have you um, may want to be aware that there could be some, some differences. Um, Okay, so lab machines can most emphatically be accessed on site. Sometimes the labs get very busy. You may want to remotely access them. Um, how many people in here have used SSH before? Okay, so a fairly large set, but not everyone. Um, uh, SSH is uh, an extremely useful tool for doing remote work on Tux Worlds, um, which helps, helps expose the, the Linux machines over there for remote login. And I would recommend it to anyone. Um, there are SSH clients, um, compatible client for Windows, Putty, that can use the, the SSH protocol for secure connection to these Linux clients. Okay? Um, those who are running Linux or, or Mac OS may want to make use of, of um, X Windows and allow you to do graphical interaction with the remote machine through, uh, through uh, X Windows. More information on this can be found <coughs> at this URL here. Um, the tech staff over in um, Sphinx could also uh, uh, speak with you about some of these issues, people like Merlin, people like Greg, or, or, or Seth. Okay, um, cut to the chase in terms of, of where are your marks from this board will come from? Well, they will come from a variety of sources. Okay. Um, there's some accommodation made in this course for participation, which I really value. That participation can come in a variety of ways. It can come with questions. It can come with uh, a request, we'll see later, for, for people to provide feedback on the lecture, what was clear, what was unclear. Um, it can also come in on the <coughs> forum. So if there's an online forum established at the class site, which is on Moodle. People have used Moodle before? Yeah, okay. So you're familiar with that Moodle.cs that you set up with So there's, you should be able to get in right now to a CMPT 214 course site. Um, right now it's kind of bare bones. There's a, there's a syllabus on there which includes this marking scheme among others. Um, so uh, participation is included in uh, the forums in one place. You could also have a problem with others. If you're, if you're not comfortable participating in the forums, um, that's fine. These marks we 
given for constructive uh, engagement of forms. Um, online technologies such as discussion groups have the notorious reputation for sometimes being abused. We won't tolerate that here. And we certainly won't reward people who are, who are uh, uh, engaging in a non-constructive action. However, if you do post uh, ideas, suggestions uh, for, for questions, help, uh, help uh, contribute to the forums um, in a healthy way, then that certainly is a way we uh, encourage participation. Okay, um, in terms of exams, there's a very substantial amount, 60% marks, which do come from the exam okay. um, And there are two exams at issue. Number one, a midterm. This is scheduled for October 24th in class. So we'll put in this, this class. Okay. Um, it's an hour and a half exam as required by the confines of the course schedule. The second exam is a final exam, which is not yet scheduled. The university is not scheduled one yet. Um, I expect it will be weeks, um, it'll be at least a couple of December. Uh, that exam has uh, a larger weight associated with it. We'll talk about the structure of those exams, what they include, what they won't include, um, as they can include. Okay. Depends on the material and uh, a little bit about um, the three which learning characters that we can So, um, what else are the marks based on? Well, they're a really substantive amount of the marking, so, so 36%, is divided between, on the one hand, 12 lab exercises, which are required, they're not optional things. Even if you think they're boring, well, come and do them really quick. 12 lab, lab exercises, you think says 11. Um, those are handed in the week of the lab. And, uh, of course, which are more substantive, more detailed, more depth, um, and which you'll be responsible for doing on your own, although you may wish to have some discussions about um, comparing notes on them, etc. Okay, so I mentioned the labs. Um, those are led by Scott Johnson. And very importantly, I want to emphasize, especially because Scott has taken this course before, he's aware of some of the things that get people tripped up on labs. And so he'll be beginning the labs. Tuesday labs, Thursday labs. Two labs in total. With a, uh, an overview of the material. What, what's going to be going on in the lab? You want to be there for that. Why? Because it's going to be talking about elements of the lab that you really have to pay attention to. Either because they're really important for learning, or because they can be ways to trip up, or because they, uh, may take a while and, and you need to be particularly uh, careful with, uh, with the order in which you approach them. You need to make sure you got certain things done first that are really solid before you can use them later in the lab, etc. So please show up on time for those labs. Okay? Um, show up on time so you get that. Um, labs specifically we do, and I'll, I'll listen to feedback on this, but we have a tight turnaround typically be due about midnight on Thursday. Okay? Um, because of the vagaries of the Moodle system, you can't actually make the, the uh, assigned time for them, uh, the deadline to be you know, just prior to midnight, as long as it's in before midnight. So we have to settle for this uh, awkward time. Now what that means is different for the, the Tuesday lab and the Thursday lab. For the Tuesday lab, you want to be very careful if you don't leave it hanging, you know, on Tuesday, I think you'll finish it up and never get around to it. And you find yourself that on Thursday, um, you know, getting, uh, getting stuck because of that, thinking it would be an easy thing to finish. You know, no For Thursday, um, my suggestion would just finish it up at the time. Get it done at the time. And uh, because there's not too much time left by the time we finish up to actually hand it in. These will be handed in electronically um, through the uh, Moodle site. Okay. Um, point of note here. I alluded to it earlier, but completing the labs is, this is kind of
kind of a non-functional pointer. Um, completing the labs is required to complete the course. Okay. They are a required component of this course. The fraction of marks is approximately one per lab, but um, they are required in order to pass that you turn in all the labs. Okay. Um, when there's code involved, we're going to be putting in place for this term a marking scheme which will put a great emphasis on good code style and good practice. The code may or may not be working, but if you adhere to good practices, there's evidence of, of testing, thoughtfulness applied to naming, thoughtfulness applied to dividing it up in a readable way, in a way that's easily understandable, the principles will be talked about. You can receive a very good mark. Does the network? It's got that null pointer exception that comes up at a certain place, a bus error. But it's clean, well documented, well commented, and in fairly transparent to read. That can be good. Um, following the design is also important. If you're going to be asked to do something and, and to show thoughtfulness in, in having done that um, is extremely important. There is significant marks for, for running the code, but it's not the majority. Okay. So, so just getting it more correct is without computation is okay. um, And in total, following the design and good code style, even if it doesn't fully work, is worth more than having a running thing which is not documented or which is not following the, uh, the recommended design, particularly writing tests before the code. Why write tests before the code? Anyone want to comment here? Yes. Exactly. It forces you to think ahead of time about how does this really need to work? You know, it's very easy to fool ourselves into thinking we understand. You dive into it, and you're halfway through, and then you realize, oh, I didn't think about this more complicated case, or it's not that simple after all. By, by writing the test first, it forces you to be very clear in your mind about how things will work. Now, that doesn't mean you can't go back and add some tests later. You typically will do that as, as the divisions become clearer but it forces you to grapple with the problem in a deeper way. Often, our impulse is to dive into creating something. And the thing we create is, is wrong. In this course, we want to make sure that you build the right thing, but also you build the thing right. So, um, just take note of this style, putting effort in, is important, and ultimately that's going to be a, a, a bigger uh, a bigger effect. So, you know, um, here's something that works in the sense that it passes basic testing by a compiler, but it's, it certainly doesn't accomplish the uh, intended operation. Subtraction is not implemented by the uh, by the first uh, the first function there. Um, the second function does work correctly. Um, it files, but it, um, it, but it has that extra functionality that the first does not. This can be considered excellent code from the perspective of, of, the, uh, of the course. Here we have something that is at least compiling, it's getting past a bunch of checks that, that will highlight things that, that could bite you. And, and you've got these assertions, which we'll be talking about, which help verify that this particular function is actually um, accomplished its task. Now, it turns out that the function doesn't accomplish these tasks, but you clearly thought it through enough that that the uh, it's just simply that there was a mistake in the top in the top function. You've thought through what the requirements are. You've explicated those requirements, and that's a real contribution. Eliciting requirements, being clear on what this has to do. Is often at least half the battle. Okay. Um, okay, so what are the expectations in terms of work? Um, you can leave university, sort of a job, and I would anticipate 10 hours of work per week for this work. Okay. This is based on past semesters. Um, maybe like other classes you take, do not count for this course taking less than that. I point to this resource as a good one for talking about time management skills and the 
a skill to be mastered. Learning how to work against certain tendencies to, you know, hopefully put something off, procrastinate, um, to, to overestimate your productivity. This is a big part of managing yourself in professional software development, learning that your estimates may be off. that given your tendencies work to kind of keep yourself allocating appropriate time to get things done. And if you finish early, great, you can use that time for, for relaxing for another course like that. Okay, um, very, very important topic. A topic that cannot be overstated for its importance. It's the issue of academic. Material in this course will sometimes be challenging. It will be challenging in ways that, that force you to push your limits, uh, push, your, push your skill set. Um, there have been cases in the past where students within this course or others have taken the easy way out and chosen not to expand themselves, not to push themselves in this regard and to, to copy things from others. Under pressure, no doubt, but um, time pressure. But in a way that short changes learning objectives and, and frankly counterfeits in a way that devalues the whole course. There's a strict policy on this uh, at UFS. Um, there's also discussion of this in the course outline that the syllabus is posted on the middle. Um, the basic gist of it is that you can have discussions. And I encourage you to have discussions about ideas, how to approach things, things you've got to watch out for, that sort of stuff. You need to, to actually do the work to get your code right, working and running it, and uh, think through the naming conventions you're going to use, think through how you're going to structure it. So you can get ideas from other people that will inform this how to do it cleanly, but you're the one who actually has to do the work. Okay? And what that means, what that rules out, is simply copying conveniently a set of code from, from other people. We have tools that will be checking for this, and we have tools that will identify problematic cases. Please do not get them on side. Okay? Um, okay, lots of resources in place, office hours, tutorial sections, etc., that are designed to provide you access really struggling with something, come and meet with me. It's right after class. Go back to my office to talk here as, as the situation allows me. We can go over and something. Please don't, don't be tempted to engage in this. It will shortchange yourself, it will shortchange other students, and the chance is it will shortchange your mind. Because if this is identified, you're a bad way. Very bad way. Discussion ideas, you know, great stuff. The syllabus talks about this in a little bit more detail. If you have questions about where that boundary lies, I'm glad to talk about them. Okay. Um, please take this very seriously. Okay, textbooks for the course. Um, and, and bear in mind, incidentally, the academic honesty, failure to adhere to those standards is not for good. You did great on on the exam, you didn't copy on, but if you're found on something, it's grounds for failure to the course. So, so, bear that in mind. So, let's talk about the textbooks. Um, there's two textbooks for the course, um, which, to be honest, I'm not, I'm not uh, fully satisfied with. They certainly don't cover all the material of the course. Um, they have uh, strong usefulness for some components of this material. Fortunately, they're available in the library as an e-book in the second case, and um, as a reserve book in the first case. There's also used versions of these that should be circulated. These were used last year, and almost certainly these book vendors have these in place. But the library uh, version of the e-book could be particularly valuable. There's also no shortage of online materials which help to understand much more now, there's some other books which are not, which are not required, but which are very, very useful. I'd like to alert you. Some software engineering students have gone to their fourth year before they've in these books. I'd like to alert you. One is uh, 
lot of discussion of techniques like uh, tracer bullets, like mocks and fakes, um, like use of assertions, etc. that uh, we don't have time to fully address. Um, these books would do well on the, on the bookshelf of anyone who's going to be writing code in, in the context of, uh, of professional software work. Um,
is not my intention, nor is it really feasible for me to spend spend you know uh, a lot of time on these things to get yourself to an advanced level. You need to explore these on your own. You need to take this understanding that's been glimpsed here, alerting you to certain things, and go and explore it and try things out. I would be happy to answer questions about these things, and I will try, where possible, to post lectures ahead of time. So you can review them and ask questions really. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, programming style and how to design programs effectively and uh, program verification and use of, of specifications. Um, so clean coding, et cetera, use of assertions, offensive and defensive program, uh, programming techniques. We're going to be talking about regular expressions. How many people in here have what they feel is a, is a decent beginning understanding of regular expressions? Couple people. Well, ladies and gentlemen, working with people from a wide variety of backgrounds. I, I worked in large teams which involved people often from the health sciences, uh, people from uh, statistics, math, a large number of other disciplines to help improve decision making, particularly in the health area. And uh, I'll tell you that regular expressions are one of those technologies that people from outside of computer science. Wish the heck they knew about, you know, uh, and got exposure to in their computer. They're one of the most useful things, even if it's just searching through documents or filtering data or whatever. They're incredibly useful. And um, this course will provide you a basic introduction to regular expressions, bearing in mind that there's later courses on language hierarchies which talk about, um, say, Pomitan and the relationship to regular expressions. But we'll be, we'll be introducing them in a way that will get you familiar with their basics so that you should be able to use them fairly reliably in, in your day-to-day -day practice. And believe me, you use them day-to-day. -day. I mean, they're so useful. They are, are one of those things that, that really enhances productivity. OK, we're going to talk about testing and coding. People in here, um, how many people in here have not used uh, GCC? Just a couple. Um, how about GED? It's going to be lovely. Okay, not, okay. Uh, very helpful. So we'll be talking about using those together to uh, to help provide insight into where a failure is occurring in the program, or to do the fault underlying failure that's that's occurring in the program. We'll be talking about use of both fences to identify where that error is occurring in the program, systematically zeroing in on the on the cause of the error that you see, whether it's null point or exception plus error, program fish disappearing from the screen, um, a, uh, some sort of problem with out of memory, etc. Okay. And we're going to be talking about how scaffolding and various sorts, things like stubs, um, things that you used to do that. We're going to talk about uh, configuration management, how you, how you can handle changes to your program. Um, those include make files, things like uh, rebuilding your program in a one-step process, but also the environment. Okay. So, um, one point before I open the floor to questions before we dive into the material. Um, at the end of each lecture, I would welcome people to submit feedback on this lecture. I've actually put some, some uh, paper up here, unless you have paper with you. Um, Hold up a piece of paper, write their end sit on it, and uh, put on that piece of paper three things. What's the lecture about? Number one. Number two, what things were clear, what things weren't clear. So give me feedback about what things I need to go into more detail, etc. If you do this, submit it in this capacity, and you can get marks for two months later. So that Mark, for example, so that up the line. Um, it does take a number of submissions, but very easy. And it lets me improve the lectures. Let's me cover the <coughs> 
trivia for associated force. Any questions related to this before we dive into to some of the material? Questions? Okay. Um, labs, ladies and gentlemen, begin next week. So those who have Thursday labs, no, no lab today. Um, I will be posting the lab assignment likely over the weekend, and uh, the Tuesday lab should be able to get it early. The Thursdays it may want to look at it to the middle site. Okay, so that's labs. Um, one other thing I wanted to to bring to your attention, um, right, um, is uh, is the issue of um, the unit boot camp. How many people here have participated in unit boot camp before? Okay, awesome. Um, so on the weekend of the uh, 14th and 15th, um, uh, there's uh, going to be a, a what's called a boot camp um, for units that covers basic and intermediate level units, and that includes the Linux um, uh, material, which is going to be held over in Spain. Um, you can go to the department website to find out information about it. The tech's set up to help prepare it. It's been going on for many years, and it's really good quality material and next resources. Okay? I suggest that you consider that. It complements what the material will have here. And frankly, I'll be going faster through a lot of that material than previous, previous years, some previous years have, just so I can cover other material in a little, little bit more depth. So Unix boot camp, I'd recommend it to anyone 14th and 15th. Um, you may even see me there. I'd like to find out what they cover and what they don't cover. Um, so I'm going to sit in some of the sessions. Okay. So any questions before we move on? OK. Um, I think, um, I think I'm going to uh, start by diving into um, issues of the uh, first topic which is um, some basic ideas from, from operating systems and shell, shell use, um, use of Unix. Um, so I'm going to stop. Um, stop